Thank you. Uh, uh, so gr grateful for that uh, introduction. And uh, I'm truly grateful to be participating with uh, this uh, world-class program uh, that you have uh, established uh, uh, at Sunnybrook and with the University of Toronto. Uh, so um, U of T also has a very uh, uh, warm uh, place in my heart. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. And uh, really, as, as um, um, Ahmed has already uh, outlined here, we're going to talk about some of the critical exercises that we do to inform our strategies, such as competition and market segmentation. They are fundamental in helping us understand our markets, help us understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the products that we are developing. It helps us understand the strategies that we need to develop and the roadmaps so that our cross-functional teams and organizations can be well aligned in developing their products and developing commercialization frameworks and implementing their commercialization strategies. Before we talk about market segmentation and competition, however, I am going to talk a little bit about the marketplace and how our global healthcare environment uh, is changing. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, the reason why we do this is so that we have a really good context of the environment that we are operating in, uh, what the challenges of that environment are. And uh, that kind of just reminds us of why it's so important of developing solid strategies uh, that are tested and validated. And these strategies begin with good market research and good uh, uh, competitive analysis exercise uh, exercises, as well as market segmentation. So here's our agenda. Uh, prior to the break, we're gonna wrap up the global healthcare outlook, talk a little bit about innovation to commercialization in the medical device space, talk about competitive analysis frameworks and market segmentation frameworks. Then we'll take a good break, eh? a 30 minute break. We'll come back. I will complete the presentation over a 15 minute period, talking a little bit about best practices in market analysis and shed some light on various tools that you can access to support uh, any work that you are doing in relation to market analysis. And then we're going to do a half hour workshop and wrap up with a good discussion. So let's first start with the global healthcare outlook. <clears throat> um, so we're coming out of the pandemic, right? We're not completely out of the woods. Um, we're still seeing infection rates uh, rising in some areas in the world, which we have seen in the news lately. Um, we know the global pandemic, uh, uh, kind of hit us with historic proportions. There were exponential advances in medicine during this time. We saw an explosion of digital technologies, data, access, and analytics. Uh, we saw more informed and empowered consumers, and we saw a movement from disease care to prevention and well-being. And what I'm going to share with you are some of the insights of what happened during COVID, but also how COVID has kind of shaped our environment going forward, coupled with these new inflationary pressures that we're seeing. I'm going to share with you a few insights from Deloitte. They did a terrific uh, report on the 2022 Global Healthcare Outlook, but it's kind of like a five-year window. It's still highly relevant today. We'll talk a little bit about what General Electric has to say from their perspective and also McKinsey and Company, who also focused on the US marketplace and how that is changing. So we'll talk a little bit about the global market, talk a little bit about the US market, because the US market is very critical to uh, uh, the aspirations of many companies based in Canada who need to succeed in the US market to grow their organizations and to succeed with their uh, uh, products and services. Let's just talk a little bit of the background here. What did we observe with the pandemic? 
Well, cases have now climbed to about 664 million. There were about almost 7 million deaths. We saw low vaccination rates in some regions, and we recognize the interconnectedness of our global populations. Just because we are vaccinated here does not mean that we're necessarily safe if other regions around the world have low vaccination rates where new variants may arise, for example. Healthcare workers are experiencing incredible emotional, physical, and professional stress. We have seen that in the news on a regular basis and still continue to see that today. And the pandemic has also decreased access to non-COVID related medical care. That's a great concern because I think we're going to pay the price for this uh, uh, over the next few years. We'll expand on that later. What is changing? We're shifting from consumer preferences and behavior uh, we're uh, we're uh, uh, seeing more integration of life sciences and healthcare. We're rapidly evolving the digital health technologies and telemedicine. I'll sh present to you some really interesting stats to see the explosive growth in this area. We're seeing new talent and care delivery models and rapidly evolving clinical innovation. How is it changing? Well, in many different ways. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we're, we, we, we went into this unfamiliar uh, world of remote working. We're, we're getting more familiar with it now. There's virtual doctor visits, supply chain shortages of medical supplies, personnel and services. And we still can still see those constraints in the healthcare system. We're, we're not out of the woods. We're elevating the human experience of the workforce and reshaping the what, how, and where work is performed, swiftly scaling virtual health services. But what we've learned is that we can't do it alone. Uh, never have we seen uh, an environment where partnerships have become more important to produce and to procure desperately needed vaccines, treatments, medical devices, and supplies. And, uh, and that's one of the big themes coming out of this. So what are some of these uh, industry leaders saying? What Deloitte focuses on, they believe that over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see an evolution on how we look at health equity. ESG, this is a big buzzword in our corporate world. This refers to environmental, social, and governance, our mental health and well-being digital transformation, future of medical science, and public health reimagined. Later in this presentation, I will expand on these items. General Electric, well, they talk more about uh, the industry, and they made five predictions for the future. And this was published just about two months ago. Uh, they uh, feel that the innovation to reduce burnout will continue because this is something that became a reality during the COVID uh, uh, years, and it still remains a reality today. Clinicians will separate what they call the wheat from the shaft when it comes to AI. What they're really talking about here is that we still have a way to go to optimize how we use AI to uh, help improve the delivery of healthcare and efficiency in our healthcare system. The technology will help the workforce reduce healthcare inequities. Telemedicine will become even more integral. I think we're there today. And precision health will revolutionize healthcare delivery. And we have seen um, uh, incredible developments with precision health over the last few years, and we'll expand on that as well. McKinsey, what did they talk about? McKinsey took a different perspective. They focused on... They focused on the, um, the economic uh, impact of COVID-19 coupled with the inflationary pressures that we're seeing today. So they, they expanded really on what are these mounting pressures, particularly in the US market, but they also talk about how we have an opportunity to thrive in this challenging environment. So um, uh, what I'm going to do is now just let's look at some of these details and we're gonna look at Deloitte and McKinsey in particular because I thought those were excellent articles that gives you really good context 
of our environment and where we're going. Let's start with Deloitte. Uh, they talked about health equity and key issues. We saw structural flaws in our system. We still have structural flaws in, uh, flaws in our system. We see systemic and unintentional biases that may be ingrained by cultural traditions, perceptions or prejudices, and clearly social, economic, and environment, our environment are really key drivers uh, of health. And these are just some of the things that are, uh, are, 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 are advancing over the next uh, several years to address health equity. It may be at the organizational level, mandating cultural competency and bias training for employees. It could be at our healthcare offerings, shifting towards uh, um, value-based uh, payment models and how we reward for equitable outcomes. Um, we're, we're investing in our communities and also from an ecosystem, there's greater consideration of diversity. It doesn't just have to be considered diversity in our environment, our workplace. It can also be with the selection of vendors as well and our suppliers so that we really build on um, some of the, uh, uh, of, of how we look at diversity and how we can improve health equity in our global environment. Um, ESG is a buzzword in the corporate world. All corporations have a, a sense of duty uh, towards our, our, our climate. Um, getting to net zero decarbonizing healthcare is also important. The healthcare industry is not spared from this. We better we understand climate change's impact on healthcare systems, infrastructures, and workforce, and we also be better understand climate change's impact on people's health and well-being. This slide here is a great example of that. In the upper half of the slide, you can see here the trends of carbon monoxide uh, uh, emissions and temperature uh, anomalies throughout our history, starting from 1970. And what you can see is a continuous rise. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see the impact that this has on healthcare, starting from exposure, whether it's direct exposure, such as drought, heat waves, wildfires, or flooding, to indirect exposure, such as water quality, air quality, land use changes, or ecological changes. And this connects the dots right to the right hand side here where you can see the impact on people. It impacts our mental health, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, waterborne disease, and heat stroke. And we're seeing this play out before our eyes globally uh, with um, our, 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 these, the environmental impact. We're seeing it in Western, the U.S. right now with the wildfires, we're seeing droughts, and uh, it, it is having a big impact on us. Okay, mental health and well-being. We still have major issues in regards to how we can improve um, uh, 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 the space of mental health. Um, there's still stigma and discrimination uh, in this space. Uh, this is an area that is still chronically underspent. Uh, underspent. We still see siloed healthcare systems. We have gaps in clinical and scientific knowledge of, of, of mental health and also how we look at the changing determinants of mental health. So there's a lot being done to improve um, uh, how we approach mental health and well-being. I, we don't have time to go through all of these, but some of the, 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 the key uh, areas of attention are is the shift from prescriptive treatment to consumer empowerment and have patients to participate in decision making for their well being. Um, uh, there's also a focus on recognizing that mental health is part of a broader overall health experience. It's impacted by our physical, social, and relational well being. That impacts all of us. We need to better identify disparities and equities in diagnosing and treating mental illness. And we're designing better models of care that augments not only face-to-face -face therapies, but also digital support because we have gone down the digital and telemedicine path. I don't think that there is going back. The question is, is that 
how do we create a balance of uh, in-person visits and digital health care, and how can we use this uh, to improve how we treat patients um, with uh, mental health uh, uh, needs. Digital transformation and healthcare delivery. Uh, we have seen an explosion here. Uh, there's a greater investment in 5G infrastructure, especially in remote regions. We're moving contact centers to the cloud. Uh, we are now uh, uh, becoming a, a world uh, where what we call healthcare delivery without walls, uh, where virtual health was now an integral part of our delivery channel. There's a lot of focus on interoperability and connectivity with new technologies that is improving efficiency and improving how we uh, deliver precision medicine, for example. And uh, we're broadening the concept of partnering to a greater degree because we cannot do this alone. And never have we seen uh, partnerships being so critical uh, in uh, delivering solutions to our uh, healthcare system. The future of medical science, well, over the last few years, much of the attention has been here. Transformational innovations with digital medicine, such as digital therapeutics or digital, what we call companions. One example is ProAir DigiHaler or Propeller Health. These companies put sensors into puffers that allows patients to be monitored uh, in real time. Uh, rather than having them come back, you know, two to three months later and uh, following up on their progress. Uh, we have never seen this before, and it is transforming the, the, the delivery of healthcare. Uh, tremendous focus on nanomedicine, genomics, artificial intelligence, and big data, biometrics, and metabolomics. And, but there's still major hur hurdles here cost, scale, and trust, and the industry is of course tapping into consumer empowerment to build a, a level of trust with them because we are sharing more private information in the cloud than, than we ever have thought uh, was possible. And uh, it's critical to build trust. Uh, we have to establish health so healthcare systems with innovation hubs and exploring collaborative funding and development models to address the complexity and the cost of bringing these innovations to in, in, in the real world. This is the final part of Deloitte's um, uh, uh, global healthcare outlook, and that is the reimagination of our public health. We are impacted by many aspects of public health, like housing, education, living and working environment, water and sanitation, and many of these other elements that you see here. And really what's important is what you see here on the right-hand side. Digital technologies is, 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 uh, is transforming our public health care systems. And many communities are now starting to focus on what they call smart cities that can make health care kind of smarter and more accessible. Uh, where people don't always have to come in, perhaps from rural communities into the big city uh, for their health needs. So um, this is an exciting area and we are seeing a transformation of how we build or evolve our communities towards a better state of health care. And this is just a, a colleague of mine shared this slide for me that came from ICVIA or IQVA who are experts in uh, uh, market analysis and reimbursement strategies. And they pre presented this slide that sh shows just after the pandemic, we saw an explosion. This is actually just 2021 stats. We saw 2,901 growth in telehealth met, uh, claims compared to 2019. In 2021, we raised 15 billion for telemed platforms 38 states expanded telehealth coverage and 29 billion was raised in digital health in 2029, which is twofold over 2020. My, the way I look at this is the train has left the station and we're not going back. And this has, I think, really quite nicely transformed our, our, our healthcare uh, environment from this context. 
What does McKinsey say? They focused on a different part of the report. They talked about the mounting pressures, and they also talked about the fact that this can be an opportunity for many organizations. In regards to the mounting pressures, they focused on the rising costs of healthcare as a fallout from COVID-19, and also as part of the inflationary pressures that we are witnessing right now. And what they forecasted is a substantial increase in healthcare costs over the next you know, six years going into 2027. But this is something that we need to pay attention to if we are launching products or we're uh, in, uh, in the 2023 timeframe. Uh, there is a substantial rise going from 2023, and then that growth will start to slow down. And this rise is in, in non-labor costs in our healthcare system, non-clinical labor costs, as well as clinical labor costs. So uh, the, the, the costs are ex increasing substantially across an array of, um, of, uh, of buckets, I call them. And, and, and they're going to continue to rise. So this is, I think, an important area of attention, particularly for those companies that are developing innovations that bring efficiencies to organizations. I look at 2023 as an amazing opportunity for a lot of medical device companies who can improve productivity and improve efficiency, and in many cases also reduce the costs while entering an environment where we are grappling with an uh, increase in, in uh, healthcare, increased costs of healthcare delivery. Uh, so uh, they also talk about the fact that resilient companies can thrive uh, in this environment, including recessions. And uh, we are on the, sometimes some call this a recession, some say we're not really in a recession. Uh, but we are in a recession-like environment right now. And this is an opportunity where leaders can redesign their organizations for speed, accelerate productivity improvements, and reshape their portfolio and innovate new business models and reallocate their resources. And you can see here that the resilient companies always outperform the non-resilient companies in a recession environment. And they... They, they get down to more specifics. In fact, they've identified that fast organizations who can pivot quickly and adapt to this change, they outperform other organizations on innovation here on the left, growth and other metrics such as finite financial performance and operational resiliency. And this is an opportunity where the good companies double down. They double down to set high aspirations. They insist on leadership alignment. They integrate culture and the capabilities of their organizations to excel in this environment. They foster what's called an owner's mindset in every employee. They empower a structure of relentless execution and they ensure change in line red. In this example, they try to get at least 20% of their workforce, at least participating in transformation. Because if we stand still in this changing environment, you won't survive. And that's really what separates the great companies from those companies who are challenged in this environment. And that's kind of the uh, a little bit of a snapshot of how General Electric, McKinsey, and Deloitte view our healthcare environment and how we're going forward and what we can expect over the next five to 10 years. We're gonna switch gears to innovation uh, from on innovation to commercialization frameworks. But before I do that, are there any questions or comments, or maybe someone wants to share an experience based on what we talked about in the last few minutes here? I do, I just wanna let you know, I do welcome your feedback. So if you have any um, sorry, I'm just checking my time clock here. If you have any um, uh, comments or if anyone wants to raise a hand, feel free to chime in. I'm open to that and I do 
uh, appreciate that sometimes uh, questions and answers makes for a better session. But also, if you maybe type it into your chat, uh, the, uh, the team there who are controlling the Zoom could perhaps call out a question, and I can pause for a moment and answer your question. We have a question, Nick. Someone is asking, what does precision health mean? Yeah, precision health. You know, uh, I'm going to give you the answer in broad terms, but historically, uh, and let's talk about um, oncology. Uh, historically, uh, we threw chemotherapy at, for the treatment of various tumors, such as lung cancer or breast cancer or leukemia. And chemotherapy is a poison. It destroys cancer cells, but it also destroys your healthy cells. Patients experience some, um, serious side effects to some chemotherapeutics like neutropenia, anemia, hair loss, nausea, and vomiting. And, um, and we threw the same chemotherapy regimen to an array of patients, but some of these patients may have unique biomarkers where their tumors might behave a little bit differently than other tumors. So over the last 20 years, our healthcare industry has been moving towards a space of precision medicine where we uh, are able to uh, better understand uh, the, uh, the nature of their disease, uh, um, the genetic aspects of their disease and how their disease might behave differently from others. Precision medicine is is tailored medicine. It's where uh, 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 interdisciplines work together uh, to uh, define a targeted approach that's customized for you specifically with the end goal of achieving better outcomes, achieving cure, for example. And uh, that's why we are seeing uh, a lot of uh, new uh, biologic therapy. We're seeing gene therapy uh, uh, advancing uh, at logarithmic rate. Uh, and uh, we are seeing better outcomes today. Cancer patients are living longer. And uh, the better that we can deliver precision medicine, uh, I think the better that we can uh, eliminate uh, serious side effects and uh, generate um, a better outcomes. So this is the future. We are already here, but we are now advancing it and taking it to the next level. I hope that 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 that's a, a helps with, with the, the question. All right, thank you for that. Let's move on to innovation to commercialization frameworks. So this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, innovation to commercialization processes, they're highly integrated, not only with your internal environment, but also your external social, scientific, and business environment. Now, what you see here in the middle is the typical path that we see when we come up with a big idea uh, and uh, we uh, develop that idea and we launch it in the marketplace. It often starts with a, um, a market need and you come up with an idea. Sometimes this is reversed. You may come up with an idea and find a, a home uh, for that great idea, but we move on to invent and produce, design, test, and prove. There's a regulatory approval process to ensure patient safety. There's manufacturing distribution strategies and market strategies, and then there's a post market and life cycle management phase of these products. This is high level, big picture. This is generally what happens in the marketplace and supporting this product development and commercialization process are knowledge, research and discovery, intellectual property management and strategy development, uh, uh, you know, ensuring that you have a sound product development process that aligns with regulatory expectations and regulatory requirements, and as well as commercialization processes. And today, we're gonna talk a little bit about the product development process and commercialization processes, 
And then after this, we will switch gears and talk about competitive analysis and market segmentation, which informs your commercialization strategy. So let's look at medical device product development and commercialization activities. This illustration here just shows you uh, uh, the, a path that goes from an idea to a launch of a product. And overseeing this entire process in most organizations, you have management team. And the management team defines the strategies, the portfolios, roadmaps, and the resources that we have to work with. Organization, a project idea may be selected. It would enter a process of product development at the very beginning here. And here, you need to understand what is the customer need, define the value proposition, and analyze the business value of the idea. And it may move on where you analyze these markets to have a deeper understanding. Competitor analyses are performed. Market segments are understood. Your go-to market is defined and it's communicated. Customer benefits are, are understood. And from there, you move on to develop your positioning and your me messaging platform as you get closer to your product launch. Engineering, well, they start generating and evaluating these solutions, including project uncertainties. Engineering confirms the direction, the value proposition, and the feasibility of developing these products. And design controls are put in place. These are good engineering practices. They demonstrate evidence that supports that a product is safe and effective based on the intended use of the product or the indications for use. And, and what we have throughout this process are these things called gates. And gates are structured throughout the process for evaluation and decision-making. Quite often, we call these go or no-go decisions because quite often you may develop a, uh, an idea, you may enter the uh, development phase of the product and somewhere along that path, there may be hazards that are identified and if the, you, you put uh, mitigation strategies in place and if these can't be overcome, sometimes there could be a gate decision where either it's a no-go or there is a pause and you have to go back and you have to correct um, uh, uh, some of these issues before you move on to the next gate. And sometimes these gates uh, define um, how uh, cash will be spent to support this development process. Uh, many organizations, they structure kind of a gated funding model as well. It doesn't just, uh, it's not just the go or no go decision, but it's also a decision that opens up um, uh, the, uh, uh, the money that is required to continue to develop these products. And look, this is a costly business. And the reason why these gates are here is so that there is always a, a, a regular intervals of evaluation and decision making. This is actually a real world example. On the left hand side, th th this comes from Zyros. They are a global company that develops surgical equipment. And on the left hand side, you can see the product development process as we know it, going from discovery to preclinical, your pathway to approval, filing, launch, safety, and uh, any changes uh, through the life cycle management of your product. And what they have created is their own nomenclature to define the stages of these. They, in, in their world, the earliest stage is the idea creation gathering. Then they move on to initiation and feasibility, then concept definition, then design and development. Then they transfer to manufacturing. You move to regulatory approval processes, and then you launch. And then there's a post-launch phase. And they just give a few examples here of the type of activities that are performed in order to move from one stage to the next stage. And these activities 
are also performed by various uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, there can be uh, an engineering and a technical team. There can also be a marketing and a sales team that performs market analysis and market strategies. These two go hand in hand across every single stage of this development process. There's also a, a vital regulatory and clinical development team as well. Should clinical trials be uh, a mandatory part of your uh, development uh, pathway? So uh, uh, this is uh, again, a costly business and the better structure an organization puts to define the activities that you need to do in developing your product the more efficiencies that can be gained in your commercialization process. I'll, I like this slide. It tells you that almost every facet of a company is, uh, is impacted right? when you develop a new product and you launch a new product. And those, uh, this includes those um, uh, activities that are require uh, regular do not require regulations and it also includes those activities that do not require regulations so um, it's a big business it's a costly business and it really engages almost everyone in an organization that's why i uh, that's why i find new product development and commercialization one of the most exciting places to be uh, in, in in an organization because there are so many moving parts and it's critical to align the organization and to ensure that there's a coordinated effort in, uh, uh, in executing all the activities that we need to do here to, um, to uh, launch products. Any questions? Um, I have a question um, about, Hi. you just mentioned, hi, <laughs> this is Sangeeta. Uh, thank hi, you for Sangeeta. the information. Um, so I have a question about the clinical development you mentioned. So when the clinical development should start? Is it like after beta or alpha or verification studies? When is the right time? Well, your clinical development uh, program will align with uh, your uh, regulatory uh, engagements with the FDA and Health Canada, for example. So I don't see uh, your clinical, any clinical trial starting with a minimal uh, uh, viable product in MVA. Typically, it would be when we have a final uh, product in place. And I just want to remind everyone that depending on the class, of, of, of a medical device. There are some classes like a class one or two that does not require uh, a, any uh, clinical trial, but there are other medical devices that are, are, are critical in treating patients, but it could also harm a patient if, because there may be some hazards associated with that product. And thus um, uh, there is a space where at times, a clinical trial may be required for a medical device, but not always. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nick, I have one more quick question about yeah. the gates. Uh, so who decides the gate timings? Yeah, uh, uh, excellent. You know, I, I, I would say it's a little bit of a, uh, it's coordinated between the product development teams and the senior management who are the gatekeepers, <laughs> right? Uh, these, are, these are the decision makers of the organization. You can't force a gate on a, on a product development path if it is not ready for that gate. Uh, typically, uh, uh, these product development processes um, have kind of a start and a stop between each of these phases. And as you approach the end of this phase, there usually is a, a, a communication mechanism in many organizations that informs the, um, uh, uh, the gatekeepers uh, that they are coming to their uh, uh, end of the stage of that phase, and they are now being prepared for, it could be gate one, gate two, gate three, or gate four. Sometimes I have seen organizations blend gate one and two, for example, combined uh, because it was the right thing to do. So uh, usually there is a schedule 
um, but there it is also driven by the product development team and their readiness to engage at a specific gate. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we're going to shift a little bit of gears here now. And I want to talk a little bit about commercialization strategies. So particularly from a, a, a getting ready for a marketplace and positioning your product to succeed in that marketplace. Commercialization frameworks include a manufacturing arm, a clinical development arm, or, or let's call it pathway, a manufacturing pathway, a clinical development and R&D pathway, a regulatory pathway, but there, and, and those three pathways are vital. They will make or break your product because you need to meet your clinical endpoints and you need to meet the regulatory requirements for approval. If either of those fail, then you don't have a product. And of course you require manufacturing, you need the product uh, 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 for, for those three. So those three are tightly coupled, but we also have other commercialization work streams, market research, marketing, and sales and launch readiness work stream. Because if you are launching your product, it's one thing to develop a product, it's another thing to launch a product and make it accessible and to win over the competition. That's what we're going to talk about right now. And, um, and, uh, and by the way, there are other work streams as well. There's marketing, there's an IP strategy work stream. These are all the elements and all the paths that need to be aligned in an overall commercialization strategy. What we're going to talk about now is one piece of that. And that is the market readiness and develop uh, and getting ready for a launch plan. Um, and question is, is where do you start? And it, it's different from an early stage company versus a large company that you may be working for. So some early stage companies, they work with what's called the business canvas model, which is a simple one pager that gives you a little bit of a snapshot on the key resources that you need to develop your product, um, your revenue streams, your customer segments. Uh, uh, my organization developed this framework here. This is called the MOA or the Market Opportunity Assessment. It does a deep dive that helps you understand the problem that you are solving, your value proposition and product uniqueness, your target customers. This is your total addressable market, but also your go-to market your competitors and your strategy. And then if you work for larger organizations that have established processes and frameworks, you may be participating in a formal process of generating market insights. And that goes to developing strategies. And then you're eventually the, 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 the tactics that we need to implement, you execute and it goes in an annual cycle. And uh, so, um, uh, but what we do know, what is common in all of these is there usually is a path that you follow. The first step in that path is generating deep insights of the market and your product and how your product is differentiated and what your competitive advantage is. And that informs your strategy your strategy should answer critical questions such as what's your winning aspiration? Where are you going to play in a market? How are you going to win in your chosen space? What capabilities have to be in place and what management systems are required to support an organization to execute flawlessly and win in the marketplace? And once we have these strategies in place, we build these roadmaps. And uh, actually, this is an example. If I can maybe just expand this a little bit. This is the example there of that commercialization roadmap where we have your R&D clinical arm, your regulatory arm, but we also have uh, a, a, a work stream to prepare 
for market access and to prepare for launching our products with a launch readiness plan. Uh, and uh, you can't do this if you don't have an understanding of your strategy and you can't build a strategy if you don't have a good understanding of the market and the uniqueness of your product. And what is fundamental to market understanding is competition and market segmentation. I'm a panelist for many pitch presentations and those companies that demonstrate a solid understanding of the competition and how you're differentiated and a solid understanding of the total addressable market and why you chose the go-to market, those companies always outperform the companies that don't do this well. And that's why we are spending some time on this today. So let's get started. Competitive analysis, it determines how you will impact the market and it informs your value proposition. Market segmentation, it identifies the distinct customer segments that have unique characteristics and behaviors that may inform your go-to of what is a total addressable market. And we're gonna do, we're gonna go into both of these in detail and uh, they really are fundamental. So is value proposition, but we don't have time to talk about that today. That will be for another workshop. Um, and again, there's a great paper that was published by Rotman in Rotman's magazine. It was done with the Rotman group in collaboration with Harvard and US industry leaders. And uh, it's about a four page uh, uh, paper and it applies to large companies, it applies to startups and it's really straightforward and simple, but it's very powerful. And what they tell you is that, you know, a good strategy should answer five questions. What's your aspiration? Where are you gonna play? How are you gonna win? And then of course, do you have the capabilities of executing? And both the competitive analysis exercises we're going to look at and the market segmentation exercises and the, the, the case study that you will all do, um, it really helps us answer these two questions, where to play in a market and how you will win. Those companies that get this wrong, they fail. Or if they have deep pockets, they have to go back and redo their launch and that's a punished launch and it's a lost opportunity and it's costly. So uh, that's why we're paying attention to this today. Okay. Any questions? We're going to move on to competition. Okay, let's see here uh, my time. Okay, I'm a little bit behind, but we will, uh, we, we, we will make up here. Um, okay, so <clears throat> bear with me. So competition, why do we do it? It drives innovation, um, it informs your value proposition. And I think it's critical to identify a competitor. Uh, it really determines the potential impact and it helps you to maneuver uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, who are competitors? They could be companies that offer the same or similar products, companies that offer substitute products, or companies with related competencies, or it could simply be status quo. Some standard operating procedures are so entrenched in our healthcare system, it's not always easy to come up with a, not, with a new idea that disrupts that system. And uh, so, so I, I look at status quo also as part of standard of, and, or standard of care as your competitor. Why, again, why do we do it? We know that a single product is rare in the marketplace. Each competitor has their own operations. Some of them will probably know more about your product and company than you do. Um, they have deep pockets to perform uh, uh, very in-depth uh, uh, competitive analyses. And it also, but it positions you to anticipate market entry of competitors. You can develop winning strategies to put yourself I think in a favorable position against that competitor, you establish a competitive advantage and it helps you succeed. These are the four 
types of competitive assessments that are commonly done or performed in the medical device space and also in the pharmaceutical or therapeutic space. Market performance assessments examine how launched products are performing, not your products, your competitor launched products. A pipeline funnel is a view to the future. It actually helps explain who to pay attention to downstream. You may not have a competitor today, but you may have a competitor coming. Competitor matrix talks about how competitors are differentiated and the strategy analysis focuses more on the competitive threats and how real they are. So this is an example of a market performance competitor assessment. It's simple. It could be a, a linear uh, graph here showing the annual revenues of your competing products, or it could be market share uh, represented in a pie chart. It shows your competitors, illustrates your competitors' performance, and identifies the market leader and trends. And it, quite often, it captures a five-year trend. Why this is important, it shows you who to pay attention to or who could be your biggest threats based on how they are performing and how they're behaving in the marketplace. A competitive funnel identifies companies and product class categories of products. It's a good review as a starting point. It helps identify those competitors that are not on the market today, but on the market that are coming. This is a therapeutics example. <clears throat> I actually put this together. It was a, 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 it was a pipeline assessment of all the drugs that are being developed to treat acute lymphoblastic leukemia at a certain point in time. And I like this because it shows you not only, in, if you look at the legend, it shows you the different class of drugs that are coming down the, 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 the pipeline. It shows you the companies who are developing them and the names of those products. And sometimes you can call out, like this Pfizer example here, some um, information that you can gather from clinicaltrials.gov uh, to provide a little bit more insights. And uh, my boss used to always ask me when I was launching a product, who keeps you up at night? And I often had a slide similar like this where we talk about who, what's coming, who is coming, and who worries you, and maybe who doesn't worry you. And a very powerful approach. The competitor matrix is something that looks like this illustration here below, where you would compare your product to various competitors against a series of attributes on the left-hand side here. This helps you understand how you're differentiated from your customer, uh, from your, your competitor. It informs your product development and it informs you on the, your competitive advantage and overall strategy. So these are some real world examples of, uh, of organizations that may be developing a new mandibular split, splint. Here are various competitors at the top. On the left-hand side, we see the various attributes that are important to patients or customers. And, and it's populated in the middle and it shows you what some of these competitors have what they don't have against these attributes. And this can inform you on what you need to produce or develop in order to compete in this space. Uh, this was another example of co companies developing mobile apps uh, that go along with positive airway pressure devices for sleep apnea. And it's just another example of comparing the different mobile apps. Progress. It shows you the different mobile apps at the at the top and the critical features that are you know valued by customers here on the left hand side, and it gives you really a sense of um, of of uh, which of those competitors uh, have the best features versus those that don't. So competitor matrix is very powerful. This is an example from a startup company in Toronto that was developing a therapeutic to uh, slow or reverse the progression of neurodegenerative disease, such as Huntington's or Parkinson's. And you could see their product here. 
and the 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 features was oral delivery minimal side effects regaining function and broad range of symptoms and diseases and you can see here why this company was excited with their innovation because it shows that if these uh, 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 features uh, holds true throughout the development phase of their product, then they will launch with a substantial advantage and most likely take significant market share from these other competitors that you see here. The last one is called a strategic landscape where you can kind of uh, create a grid here uh, with two variables. Um, I'm just gonna go right to the example. This is an example uh, for uh, the development of uh, new therapeutics in the lung cancer space. The legend shows you the different class of therapeutics being developed for lung cancer. And they're plotted on this grid against two dimensions, the potential impact of these products and the probability of these companies successfully uh, um, uh, uh, generating the outcomes uh, that uh, they are aspiring to achieve. And uh, I also use this slide to discuss with my former boss on who keeps me up at night. Usually it was those companies here on the very top right that had the highest probability of achievement, but they could also have the biggest impact in the marketplace. And uh, I'll skip that example. So I think that summarizes the four types of competitive tools that we could use. Um, the key takeaway here is be astute uh, about co your competitive threats. Know who's out there, when they're going to come, and how their products are unique. And uh, the competitive landscape, it, it, you can't inform a strategy or a strategy is, is a weak strategy if you don't have the competitive insights there. So I'm hoping these tools will help you in your, um, your uh, in the development of your strategies. Okay, we're on the final stretch here. We're just a little bit behind, but I will make it up in the second half and give you back five to 10 minutes. So um, I'm just gonna wrap up with market segmentation and then we'll take a good break and uh, and uh, let's go from there. So market segmentation is about identifying unique segments of an addressable market. Uh, it can be driven by qualitative and quantitative data. And there are a number of different ways to do it. But one thing that's clear is no matter which way you do it, when we identify segments of customers, these segments make up a total addressable market. And most of these tools do that. There are a, a number of different ways to do it. Uh, uh, pardon me here. There's a number of different ways to do it. Uh, this slide here, uh, but you need to know certain terms. Uh, the total addressable market represents all potential markets and or customers. Your served addressable market are the segments that align with your value proposition and capabilities. And your target market, that is your go-to. That's what where you're launching. And in most pitch presentations, the VCs will ask, what is your go-to market? Where is your market best served? Or uh, uh, what market is best served? Or what is your total addressable market that might examine the big potential of your product uh, in the future? These are terms that you all need to be familiar with. Market segmentation positions you to examine opportunities. It quantified, you can quantify the segments. It allows you to forecast, project revenues. It informs on key activities such as targeting and positioning, R&D and resourcing. It allows for targeted strategies and it positions you to succinctly articulate uh, 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 who your target customers are. And it answers these additional questions, right? How big is the opportunity? How does your value proposition align with the needs of your target market? What's your go-to market? What is your projected revenue? How does your R&D plan align with different segments? All right. So these are, we're going to look at two different ways of performing these market segments. Um, 
They both require variables to help create groups or segments. But one thing they both do is the total distinct segments makes up your total addressable market. This is the single cascade model. And on the left-hand side, you can use geographic variables, demographic, psychographic, or behavioral. And I like this example because it uses an example from each of these variables. The types of variables that you use and how many variable you use is up to you. And it will be very distinct and unique for every product and every company. But in this example, a company was developing a medical image device. Their total, uh, the, the, their geographical market was Europe with, a, with an eye on Germany because they were very, uh, a, an attractive market with medical devices. The demographic variable was they focus on radiologists and group buyers and homes that have 200 to 500 beds. The psychographic variable is they focus on those who place a premium on customer service and are willing to adopt new technologies. And the behavioral variable are those centers that perform more than 20,000 image procedures a month. Why this is important? If you only have certain amount of resources to execute uh, your product launch, you, you can't play in the space above. You just don't have the resources to do this. What this shows you is a meth methodical thought process that really brings you to those customers where you will make the greatest impact in your launch. And this is an example of a single cascade model. I saw another company that used this model for launching a drug in hypertension. Their total addressable market was the total hypertension patients, but they are focusing on high risk patients for cardiovascular event. Then they whittled it down further to high risk patients for cardiovascular event, not that treatment goal. And then they focused on those patients that have private insurance because that's where the payers are at launch prior to the other reimbursement mechanisms kicking in. This is an example of a thought process of a company knowing exactly where to go at launch to optimize their, uh, their launch metrics and the uptake of their product. That was their thought process. And their thought process was backed up by market research, secondary data, primary market research and chart parts to validate with secondary data. Really great model and tool. I would recommend all of you to try this if you are developing strategies where you need to hone in on your go-to market. There's another way of doing it. And this is, uh, uh, we're on the home stretch here. It's called the strategic grid market segmentation model where you can also use different variables. It takes three steps to do. You begin with a grid and pay attention here because you're all going to do this when we break out for the exercise, okay? The first thing that you do is you plot the segments of the variables. And I'm gonna show you an example. They should be actionable variables and meaningful variables. So here is a company that was developing a drug for hyper dyslipidemia. In other words, cholesterol. And they broke down their market into those doctors who treat cholesterol and the different risk levels of the disease. There's low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And the next st step that they did is they used, uh, uh, they identified different segments of that based on those variables. So they identified five distinct segments. And it's common sense here. For example, a family doctor is quite often involved in managing low risk disease or some moderate disease. But once patients are challenged, they're not at target, they're statin intolerant, or they're very high risk, they're treated not only by the family doctor, but also specialists like cardiologists, endocrinologists, and internal medicine. The last step is to 
characterize or quantify the segments. And in this example, they did that here. They showed that about 45% of patients are slightly under fall into the low risk category. 33% of patients are well controlled, but the rest of the patients fall into those that are not at target or statin intolerant or they're serious cases of high risk. And they populated each of these segments with helpful information that helps them understand how to uh, move forward in this marketplace and what to pay attention to from a competitive perspective. Okay. And when you finish this exercise, it doesn't always have to be presented this way. Sometimes you can take what you've created and you can spin it in a different way in a pitch presentation, for example, such this company was developing a contact lens to measure glucose and other biomarkers. Here in a nice table, they did this exercise, sorry, they did this exercise, but then they spun out a table showing the market type, the segments, the number of patients, and the pie chart showing the proportion of these patients. Um, and uh, really, really nicely done. And I recall seeing this pitch and they received excellent feedback for their insights on, on, on their market. So segmentation ensures that you target better. It, it makes for better positioning and optimized outcomes. Okay, here's your assignment. And we'll do the assignment uh, after we come back from break. It is as follows. You're going to be broken out into teams. There will be a participative team. You'll be broken down into groups. We need one scriber and a presenter. You're going to do a case study. You're going to spend 10 minutes reviewing a reading assignment and 20 minutes doing the exercise. You will come back to the session and then we're going to spend five to 10 minutes as a group to review one or two examples. We don't have enough time for all of you to do this. So we will be looking for a volunteer. The assignment is based on the following background. You're a new company to develop a sleep apnea product. Okay, it's a mandibular device, right? That's the first product they created was a new device for sleep apnea. It's an oral mandibular advancement device, also called a mass, to improve airflow. Um, it's a custom molded high comfort produced by 3D printing. It has improved compliance, less costly to manufacture. You're meeting with a venture capital firm to raise funds. The firm has asked you questions about the sleep apnea market. They want a thorough understanding of the market segments that make up the sleep apnea market. So you're going to review sleepapnea.org website. The URL is uh, uh, provided here. Uh, I'm going to have the URL up. When you come back, you will be able to go into it. Use the two by two segmentation model to illustrate the sleep apnea market segments. And consider these variables. I'm giving you a hint. On one axis, include the different types of sleep apnea. On the other axis, uh, on the other axis, include the severity of sleep apnea. Okay, that's a big hint. And um, right, so first, review the website, have a quick look at it, 10 minutes, then identify the different types of sleep apnea identify the different severities of the apnea and create that grid, all right? So you create the variables and if you get a chance, try to identify the segments. And if for those of you who are really good at this, and if we have the time, you may even be able to populate some characteristics of those market segments. Somebody in each group needs to have a computer where you open up a PowerPoint presentation and create a grid like this. It's a five by five grid or a three by three grid. And then you populate the variables in those grids. It's very straightforward. 
minutes, right? So, um, and that's it. We're going to take a break now and we're going to, when we come back, I will wrap up with market analysis and then we'll go right into the exercise. Ahmed, question for you. Do you still want to give a half an hour because I can manage the time or do you want to just shorten the break maybe by a few minutes and have a 20 minute break or a 25 minute break? What is your guidance? I think uh, taking uh, like a 15 or 20 minute break, which should be fine. I, I'm just mindful that some people might leave by seven. So uh, um, okay. if we can maybe take 15 minute break and then come back at six o'clock, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And uh, I appreciate your, uh, your patience <laughs> and understanding. <laughs> And when we, when we start market analysis, if you have any questions, we'll start with any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. This was a very outstanding and insightful presentation. I loved how you primed the audience, not just on market segmentation and competition, but also on the current landscape and the innovation to commercialization process and how market assessment informs business strategy. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to the next part of the session. It gets better. <laughs> yeah, All right. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. See, See everyone at six o'clock.